Welcome everyone, I'm Doug Bunn, that's the uh, Executive Dean here on the Curry campus of Southwestern Oregon Community College and I, I would welcome you to tonight's Walk and Beyond event. Um, I would also remind you that we have some upcoming events that I think are going to be really good if they're of interest to you. Brandon Hodges will be here next Tuesday with what happens after the paycheck stop and that's about retirement, not about unemployment. <laughs> Joseph Tremonti, one of our faculty members, will be here on the 18th. His topic will be Sasquatch and the Wild Rivers Coast. I'm told that you leave a believer, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and then Mary Jane LaBelle will be here on the 25th talking about America's healthcare system, the past, present, and the future. Our lecture series this month is on climate change and uh, that will start on Thursday at 3 o'clock here in, uh, I think here in this room. My wife's nodding yes, but she doesn't know. Um, I'll ask John in the morning, but I'm pretty sure. Anyway, with that, uh, we do have drinks if you would like peanuts or drinks or anything. We're, we're so pleased to have you here tonight. Uh, Judith Ligius and I met a few weeks ago, and she put me on to a really cute uh, movie and uh, about obituaries and uh, we were talking about genealogy and she wanted to start with obituaries so <laughs> I'm going to turn the time over to her. She's a genealogist and, and I think we're all going to have a really good time. Thank so, you. Judith, thank you. So uh, just like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I spent the last 15 years before I retired in the largest genealogical collection west of Ottawa on the west coast of Canada. And so I was there helping people with their research, and it was natural for me to become interested in obituaries, along with death records and eulogies. And I believe the three are very closely related, so I'm going to touch on those tonight, and hopefully give you some insight on why it's a good idea to write our obituaries, and a little bit about how you can go about it, some useful tips. So in front of you, you have a blank obituary form. I have another one to give you later on that's more detailed with some tips about how to write a good obituary. But I thought it would be better if we uh, concentrate on how to go about it and what should be in it so that you're not reading all that information that you can use at home. <coughs> so um, when we write an obituary, it's not just about our death. It's about the achievements and the kind of life that we've lived. And if we can get it down on paper before we die, it means that our records will be a whole lot more accurate than if we didn't. For instance, um, when Jim's mother died, I had her birth certificate and I knew when she was born. But Jim was a bit confused because she had lived in various places as to where she had been born. And so the death certificate was incorrect. And in my experience, about 50% of death records are incorrect. It's because it's a difficult time. People are under duress. They're writing down what they really believe to be true. And a lot of the time, it's not. And if you look at a death record, it's very basic. And it doesn't matter whether it's in a different county or a different state or a different country. The basic facts are there. Where you were born, where you died, and what age you were when you died. It's very basic. If we can write an obituary that's accurate, we can help eliminate incorrect death records. That's the way I see it. So if you were to die today, what would your obituary say? You think about your life, the past and the present, and after you've died, what would you be sharing with your friends and family? Who would you include in your life's obituary? Ask yourself which of those things would describe your life, and would people remember the passion, the dedication, the love and understanding, and the caring that you've done and experienced in your life? What would your family say about you? What would your friends and peers say about you? So I will leave you with that thought so that Later on, you might think a bit more about what should I really put in my obituary. So 
So what is it? What is an obituary? What should it say? Well, a very simple definition is that it's a, a report of a recent death and included should be details of the name and the age of the person that died, where she belonged, meaning um, where did she grow up, he or she, where did she live at the time of death, and um, some memories of the kind of person that she was when she was growing up. Uh, a short biographical sketch is a really good idea, and when we start writing these biographical things, it's easy to get carried away and write far too much, so we have to remember to edit out at the end when, when we've done our obituary, we've done our biographical sketch. We have to summarize and not make it too lengthy. But at best, really, it's, it's a person's life lived and the legacy that they will leave because once you've written your obituary, it's always going to be there because you can get archives of newspaper or obituaries back ever since newspapers began. And even further back in Europe, like in the 1600s, you could get newspaper obituaries. And now, they're all online and nobody takes anything off the internet. It's always there. So from now on, our obituaries will be around forever. So um, I, I want to share this with you. In, instead of dwelling on death, they really celebrate life. And some media often prepare obituaries in advance of famous people, and they have them all ready to go for when they die. So uh, here's a case where quite often these pre-written obituaries will be prematurely uh, placed in the paper. In the early 1990s, a BBC DJ named Neil James noted that it was Dylan's birthday, meaning Bob Dylan, what a shame Dylan isn't around to see it, he said. Well, he's still alive. <laughs> and this happens a lot with people, that their obituaries are written in advance. And they get, I think George W. Bush's obituary was prematurely um, in the newspaper, and several other really well-known people. So it's not surprising, but it's good to double check. Uh, my mother used to read the newspapers, um, the obituaries every morning. So this is something that I've started to do just out of interest. I pick up the paper and I want to know what sort of a life did this person have? Why were they dead at 44? What happened to them? You know, this kind of thing. And my mother would start reading the newspaper, and I was too young to understand death at the time. What's going on that she's crying over this newspaper? And I'd say, Mom, what's going on? You know, what's so sad? And she said, oh, they died. <laughs> but if you're not old enough to understand death, you know, it's all very confusing. And, but still she felt compelled every morning, first cup of tea, and the newspaper, and straight to the obituaries. Who reads the obituaries? Most of us, yeah. And do you find that they are exciting, humorous, enlightening, or can they be boring and dull? What's the mean? Yeah, usually dull and over sincere and morbid even sometimes. So has anybody written their own obituary? Good, good. Who really knows about you though? I, I wonder about family members. Um, on the other hand, out that I'm, I'm going to give you, uh, it gives you uh, tips about the kinds of things that you can write in your obituary. And what I started to do with mine was to write down the things that people wouldn't necessarily know about me. And so, for instance, my grade five and six school teacher, Mr. Edgar, was a, a concert violinist, and he left the most enormous impression on me. And in my obituary, I want to thank him for instilling the love of music. Because in grade five, we had a traveling recording band, a traveling choir. We went all over the state of Victoria in Australia, where I grew up. We were on TV, we were on radio, we were in competitions. And my sister played the solo parts. 
And he was so concerned when we were, we graduated from grade six to high school, there was nothing in between. When we left grade six, he wanted to be sure that we would continue our music. And he said, you know, the fingering of the recording is the same as the bagpipes. And he said to my sister, you're so good at this, you should play the bagpipes. And so she did. And uh, he was just such a fabulous teacher. I need to mention him in my obituary and what a difference he made to so many children year after year of these kids passing through his grade. And uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about me is that I helped my dad replace transmissions and rebuild carburetors and radiators. He had six dump trucks in the backyard, but he wouldn't hire a mechanic. So this is the kind of thing that I used to do to help him. He also taught me how to throw a fleece, a sheep's fleece. And not many people get to do that because the moment that you, you throw it onto a table to check for bits of fur and um, things that shouldn't be there, bits of grass, the moment that you take this fleece, that you very carefully pick up and throw it onto a wire mesh table, if any of those fibers of fleece come apart, it immediately loses its value. So it's a real honor and privilege to be taught how to do that. And not many girls get to do it. So that was another thing that people wouldn't know about me. Another thing that I did that was sort of unusual, I thought, was I used preschool picture books to help grade four non-readers appreciate a book without reading. And I felt really good about this because I was working in the children's department of a library in Victoria, BC. And the, the boss said, we don't have enough readership. We don't have enough kids coming into the library. So I had some ideas. And she said, well, you go out there to the schools and you bring them in. <laughs> and that was one of the things that I wanted the, these children to know, especially boys who hadn't really begun reading yet and enjoying it. I, I was showing them what wonderful illustrations there were in these books. And I said, who likes to draw? Well, of course, all the boys put their hands up. And I chose very carefully these beautifully illustrated books and how they could appreciate the artwork. And I got in the back door that way. So um, one other thing that was sort of unusual that I'd like to share, and I'll get on with this, uh, I in cooperation with the Banfield Marine Station on Vancouver Island, I planted two kelp farms. And they wanted to experiment with Japanese seed, kelp seed, to see if it would grow in BC waters. Well, there's an island um, up near Desolation Sound that's a real misfit. It's called Savory Island. And it's about seven miles long. And it has cactus growing on the beach in October white sandy beaches. Well, the problem with Savory Island and kelp was that the water was too warm and it got moldy, even three meters under the surface of the water. Anyway, it was an experiment and that was another thing that I did that not many people would know about. So I'd like to read you um, uh, an obituary that was unusual and I think worth listening to. The headline says, Irishman dies from stubbornness whiskey. Chris Connors died at the age of 67 after trying to box his bikini bland hospice nurse just moments earlier. Ladies man, game slayer, outlaw Connors told his last inappropriate joke on Friday, December the 19th, 2016, which cannot be printed here. Judith, sure, can you speak up here? Oh, yeah. sure. I can come out a bit too. Yeah. Anyone else fighting ALS and stage four pancreatic cancer would have gone quietly into the night. The Connors was stark naked, drinking champagne and a house full of friends, and a family as El Green played from the speakers. He lived a thousand years in the 67 calendar years we had with him because he attacked life. He grabbed it by the lapels, he kissed it, and swung it back onto the dance floor. At the age of 26, he planned to circumnavigate the world. Instead, he ended up spending 40 hours on a raft off the coast of Panama. In 1974, he founded the Quincy Rugby, Rugby Club. In his 30s, he sustained a knife wound while trying to save a woman from being mugged in New York City. He didn't slow down. At the age of 64, he climbed to the base camp of Mount Everest. 
Throughout his life, he was an accomplished hunter, birth control device tester, with some, <laughs> with some failures, notably Caitlin Connors, 33, <laughs> Chris Connors, 11, and Liam Connors, 8. Chris enjoyed cross-dressing, a well-made fire, and mashed potatoes with lots of butter. Of all the people he touched, both willing and unwilling, his most <laughs> proud achievement was marrying his wife, Emily A. O. Collins, who supported him in all his glory during his heyday and lovingly supported him physically during their last few days together. Absolute vodka and simply orange companies are devastated by the loss of <laughs> The celebration of his life will be held during happy hour at 4 o'clock in New York Harbor, Monday the 19th of December, in lieu of flowers, please pay the open bar tab or donate to Connor's Water Safety Fund. <laughs> so, you know, obituaries are changing dramatically and there's more humor and lightheartedness in them. And we thought it's just astounding what people are writing about themselves. I saw one in the pilot a couple of years ago and I wish I had kept it because it started off with these dreadful things that this man was apparently um, leading his life this way and was responsible for it. All these terrible things were listed. And at the end he said, well, thanks to cancer, I was able to write my own obituary. <laughs> but it was devastating to read all these awful things that you thought somebody else had written about him. So anyway, I think that uh, one of the things that we should think about when we're writing obituaries is to start with the story. And if you start listing all those accomplishments and unusual things about yourself, it's easy to get a story together. And if you do something like that, it will grab the audience that's reading this obituary, <laughs> friends and relatives and people that don't even know you. I mean, we don't know who Mr. Connors was, but he certainly had a very interesting obituary. And, uh, and so if you just begin with a few sentences of telling what your life was really like, then it's easy to go on because after that you've got to give some facts and uh, where did you die and when and you don't necessarily have to say how. And the nice thing about writing your own obituary is you can choose. You've got the last word. You can choose what's going to go in it. And the one main thing that with that form is showing you is that right at the end you've got to put your, your date and place of death so somebody else will obviously fill that in and there's lots of things that can uh, go into an obituary that maybe you decide you don't really want to put in you might not want to mention an ex-spouse you don't have to do that and, and if you've got stepchildren and things like that you can make it just the way you want it to be uh, but I think it's important to show where you grew up and, and what happened there and, and how different how different it would be your life uh, then and now when, when you when you uh, passed away. Now there was something darn, I've lost it, that I wanted to share with you about uh, how to introduce something interesting. Um, into your obituary. So, so when you say things like, um, hang on a minute. Instead of saying she immigrated to Canada in 1966, you could say something. This is about me. Because it was more expensive to fly to Vancouver, BC, in 1966. Judith took the P&O steamship from Melbourne to Vancouver, which included many ports of call over the three-week transit across the Pacific Ocean. Well, far more interesting than say she immigrated. Mm -hmm. you know. So a little bit of detail with that makes it so much more enlightening and interesting. So I think too we need to say who we loved. Um, as with the school teacher, what kind of an impression he left it with me. The people that are close to us, I think, need to be acknowledged. And uh, whether it was a best friend or a school teacher or whoever it was, why was it important to you? What, 
What was it about them that left such an impression on you? And it's, it's optional whether or not you need to say anything about your uh, after-death arrangements, whether you want to be cremated or not, because usually the family knows about that. And if, if they don't know, well then maybe this is a time when you can put it in. But everything is optional. So on this handout that I gave you, my obituary, it's just something that I made up. But if you wanted to get ideas about uh, a form for yourself, there's lots online. And I've, I've given you quite a few websites on your second handout where you can go and look for templates. And they're free and you can print them off. But I wanted to give you this so that maybe when you go home you can start thinking about this if you haven't already. And you can get started with it. So on the, uh, the second handout you'll see some tips for writing your own obituary. And I think what's really important that we might not think about is with women we need to put our maiden name and we also need to put nicknames because I just found out recently that one of my brother-in-law's name was not Tom at all, it was Stanley. It's not a nickname but I mean it was only on his death certificate that I read it and I had no idea what his real name was. My mother was always called Molly but her name was Eva Wilder. <laughs> so, you know, if, if somebody who didn't know filled out the death record, other people would never be able to find her by the name of Molly. And if you didn't know her maiden name. So those kind of things are important. And it's not that important, the order of which you put things. So I came across, I came across this one obituary that said nothing at all about the family. This was really interesting. And her writing achievements was all that was written about, really. And it, and it was obviously very important. So she died January 26, 2020, in Maryland. This is Elizabeth Cullinan. She was the author of a number of short stories, 23 of which appeared in the New Yorker magazine. <coughs> Two collections of these stories were later published by Horton and Mifflin and Viking Press, large publishing companies. In addition to the short stories, Miss Cullinan published two novels, and they go on to list those, and then she got all these awards for them, and she was the recipient of grants from the National Endowment of Arts and Carnegie Fund for this work. Miss Cullen joined the staff of New, The New Yorker and became William Maxwell's secretary and later stated that working for William Maxwell was like nothing else in the world except for reading his novels, which I thought was charming. Later on in the obituary, they very briefly mentioned her survivors, and that was it. So it was sort of a, a, an unusual obituary. And this man had a very interesting life. He was Dr. Balua Bagaban, grandfather, husband, brother, son, and friend, passed away January 19. 2020, New York City. He was 85 years old. Survived by his daughter and the large, immediate, and extended family. So that's all he says about his family. He was a renowned surgical pathologist, co-inventor of the automatic internal defibrillator, photographer, home chef, amateur bartender, magician, really, carpenter, really, chocolatier, world traveler, tribal doctor, Classical musician, humorist, perfectionist, practical joker, camper, liberal, humorist, card shark, gambler, philosopher, scholar, author, generous person, philanthropist, teacher, renaissance man, an extraordinary gentleman, greatness, one of a kind. Do not send flowers because they look better while they're still alive. <laughs> so there is a huge variety, isn't there, of what people want to say about themselves. But in order to get attention, I think it has to be compelling in some way, and some of these people have got a handle on it. Of course, there are professional um, obituary writers, and you pay for them, and that's what comes up in that movie. Has anybody seen that movie, Last Word? Oh, well, <laughs> it's really very good. It's uh, Shirley MacLaine is the main character. And the whole idea of the, the last word is that she wants to have the last word in her own obituary. 
So she goes to a newspaper where they have writers, and she says to this girl, I want you to write my obituary, and the girl says, well, I'll be very happy to do that when the time comes. No, she said, I want to do it right now, while I'm alive, and I want to oversee it. Well, it turns out that Shirley MacLaine was not a very nice person, and the writer had a very difficult time trying to find anything positive to say about this woman, and that's what the movie's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get it at the Czech Cover Library. I think they have to bring it in from somewhere else, but at least it's free, and you won't have to pay for it online. But, but uh, I think, I think it, it kind of got me interested in doing my own obituary after seeing her in this movie. And uh, so, what else have I got to say to you? Um, got some more obituaries to read to you, but about newspapers, I did some investigation. Now, I knew that paying for an obituary in the newspaper was going to be costly. Some people pay three or four hundred dollars, depending on where they live. The, um, the pilot and the triplicate both have the same rates, and for about 300, uh, about 300 words, about $125. And uh, if you go to Ashland Tidings or the Medford Tribune, uh, it's a little bit more, and you also pay for a photograph. Uh, death notices at those two last newspapers are $35, and the pilot is free. So the difference, if you don't know already, uh, between a death notice and obituary is a death notice will simply state this person died on a certain day, and that's about it. Um, sometimes they'll say uh, a full obituary will follow, or a funeral service notice will follow, that sort of thing. But at least in the pilot and the triplicate, you can get a death notice free if you want. Did you say there was a limit to the number of words that oh, they no. would accept? No, not at all. I was just saying for about 300 words. Oh, so it, you could have like a half page. Oh, if you want. If you want I to pay for it. a whole page. <laughs> That's right. But the tricky thing about phoning these newspapers and finding out what their rates are is that they all have a different system. Somebody will say so many inches, so many words, so many characters, counting the spaces. So you have to be very careful when you ask questions. But I think now, um, hi, yes. Uh, my daughter passed away four years ago from cancer, and so I had to write her obituary. And we wanted to put it in the paper where she grew up, in Woodland, California. It was $600. Yes, I'm not surprised. And then to have it in the paper here it was something like about 300 or something yeah. like that. And they, they go by by letter. Yes, and, and you count the spaces as a letter. And so we were trying to shorten it for the $600 when I thought, whoa, I was not expecting that. I mean, so, I mean, that can be expensive. It was like $1,000 just getting notices out. And some of them wanted um, $45 to include a photograph, and you'll often see a before and current photograph, you know, so that's even more. But now you can put all of it. Oh, and what these newspapers said was for an extra fifty dollars, they put it on the internet for you. Well, you can do that yourself, free. <laughs> so um, I could not get any um, answer back from the San Francisco Chronicle, and I thought that might be interesting because we can buy it here and it's West Coast, and of course the um, the, the papers on the East Coast are very expensive. And I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I've been told that in, in the, uh, what's the, uh, the main newspaper in New York? Uh, New York Times. Times. Yeah. They choose who they want. Just because you submit your obituary doesn't mean it'll get in. So they just want to choose the ones they want. Important. Yeah, yeah, the important people or who they, who they deem to be important anyway. So if you're writing an obituary for somebody else, it's really not that much different because it's suggested that we write in third person or in the narrative. So we write about ourselves as if we're talking about somebody else. I think that's, is that right, Shirley? Is that a good description of third person? Well, yes, I understand that's the right way to do it. I'm not, I'm not sure that it's the way to do it, but that's, what yeah. I have been It told. seems to be the trend. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, Which and separates you from the personal. And yeah, and instead of saying I, I, I. Yeah. 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 
and it doesn't really matter if people don't know it, that you wrote it. It's right, I suppose. So uh, I mentioned earlier death certificates. Um, they're kind of interesting too because, like I said, if you don't put the right place of birth, from then on, people doing their genealogy could easily have everything wrong. And it's really important that that death certificate be right now, because most places will not release, most Bible, uh, Bible statistics officers will not release death records, uh, except for when you have to have one for family reasons. Um, like, for instance, there's many places in the world that you can't get a death record until it's 20 years old. Yes, it's not unusual. And it's the same with marriages and, and births. They hold them back. Not everywhere, but you know, it's different wherever you go. So to get these death records accurate is really, really important. And I want to drive that message home again that if we make our obituaries accurate, from then on, things will be better. So included with death records, um, we have eulogies. And eulogies are like an overview of your life. And you could write it uh, about yourself if you want, or you could have somebody else write it. And it's usually, usually you're chosen by a family member to speak at a funeral or a celebration of life. And if you think about what should go in it, it's very, very close to an obituary. It's a little overview of, of the person's life. Um, some details about friends and relatives, kind of life they lived. And it's appropriate, both in obituaries and eulogies, to include a favorite song or a piece of music that people like to illustrate. This was their interest, this is the kind of person that they are. And uh, one, of, one of the easiest eulogies I ever had to give was by telephone. And therefore, I didn't get to see the congregation. They didn't get to see me. And it was for uh, an eight-year-old nephew who had died of brain cancer. And he and I had this special relationship, even though I had never met him. So we had little notes in the mail. We'd talk on the telephone. And I would read him stories and send them on cassette tape. So, and then we discussed them later on. So we got this relationship going, and it was very special because nobody else had this kind of closeness. And everybody was, of course, worried about him and seeing through his treatment and that sort of thing. So I visualized, closed my eyes and visualized what this child was like and my experiences with him. And then I could speak from the heart. And, and speaking through the, the Cancer Society page for the call, and, and it was live at the funeral. So it was a very special time, but much easier than standing up in front of 200 people who are mourning. And I felt, I felt it was um, quite a privilege to be able to do that, but, but I felt it a, a huge advantage because it was easier for me than everybody else that was was there. So anyway, when you've written all these things, whether they're obituaries, eulogies, or whatever it is, I think it's a good idea to set it aside for a day or two and then go back to it and review and maybe have somebody else review it. I had a friend in Brookings who was dying and she called me over to see her and said, would you read my obituary? Give me some critique on it, she said. And uh, I said, well, um, Hilda, there's a couple of grammatical errors. <laughs> and uh, that's what I'd like to point out. I think your story is engaging. It's, it's great. But, uh, and she looked at me and said, Judith, this is Brookings. <laughs> and I, I was annoyed. I said, listen, I live in Brookings, and I find that insulting. <laughs> and if you say that to somebody else, I mean, it's a reflection on you, too. You're writing this obituary, and you're telling me that we don't have to worry about the standard of English in Brookings? Come on. <laughs> so I've never forgotten that, and I thought I've got to make sure that my, my grammar and my sentences are well formed <laughs> when I do it. 
Were you friends after that? <laughs> well, <laughs> the funny thing was, there she was laying there, you know, willing herself to die. And soon after we talked about the obituary, she's up and running around. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, she was broken hearted. Her husband had died, and so it, it wasn't very long after that. And she knew that she wasn't going to live much longer. But I was just appalled at the attitude. And I, my, my sympathy wasn't with her. But one of the other things I want to mention is that um, death cafes are becoming very popular. Death cafes. Death cafes. And I only just heard about this recently. They're in 69 countries already, and there's over 10,000 of them. And last month, already, five of them popped up in Washington, D.C. And what they are, uh, are groups of people who are coming together to educate themselves about death. And they support each other, and they, they actually have obituary writing classes. And they just sit around and have tea and cake, and they usually have it in a, and they're free. I think they charge $10 for their obituary writing classes. But these death cafes, and if you look for one, deathcafe.com, the closest one to us is Half Moon Bay in California. I couldn't find one in Oregon. But they are all over the world now, which is amazing. And then there's this YouTube that we've discovered. What is it, the, what, the mortician? The... Uh, you're looking for the name, I don't remember her name. Oh, wait. Ask, her, ask a mortician. Ask a mortician. So this lady, this lady, uh, Caitlin Doherty, her name is. She uh, works out of San Francisco. She is a mortician. And what she wants to do is lighten up the whole idea. <coughs> And so she does these YouTubes on different subjects. <laughs> it's fun. It really is. So those are the two new things that I've learned about recently. But the death of face, um, I think, are probably very good for some people because they need a little bit of help. And it's not necessarily uh, a support group. They're there to talk about how they can get all of these details together before it's too late. And I think it's a good idea. Maybe somebody will start one in Brookings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, now that you brought it up, someone will. <laughs> <laughs> well, go to deathcafe.com and, and have a look. Um, and, and another thing that we've been thinking about is um, if we got our friends to fill out one of these obituary forms, and then some more information about them. We could have an obituary party. <laughs> Seriously. And, and invite people who would like to learn about each other. And they, would, they wouldn't necessarily have to sit down there and write it, but it would get them thinking about I themselves. And I said I'd write a short story about it. <laughs> yeah, you could start with a short story. Well, I said, I said to my friend, well, I think I'll write a short story about this. And she's like, oh, no. I'm oh, you see? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. And you know, there's so all kinds of subject. genealogical magazines that would take those kinds of stories because they love them. There's, there's dozens of them out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, does anybody have any questions right now? Yeah, don't you think that the attitude of death in the U.S. is, I mean, it's not normal. I mean, the way they look at death, death should be just a process or a continuation. I mean, you're born, you live, and you die. So why are people always afraid of dying, you know? I mean, what is this thing about death that terrifies everybody? I'm not saying that I want to die now, but I'm not afraid of dying. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just a natural process. I agree, and I think it's kind of an old-fashioned idea that people are afraid, because if we've had a life well lived. I remember my uncle being 96 at my brother's funeral, and my brother was 17, mm -hmm. and he said, this just isn't right. I've had a great life. I would swap if I could right now, you know, because I'm the one that should be dying. And he had no real reason to continue living, he said. You know, he had good health and everything, but he couldn't care less if he kept on living. But I think that 
you know, with our uh, invention of celebration of life, which is an extension of wakes, people are celebrating together and helping each other get through um, losing a friend or a relative. Don't you think a lot of it has to do with their religious belief system? If oh, people the, who being afraid, being either afraid or happy to to say, okay, I'm. I'm ready to go because I'm going to have it. I mean, there's a lot of that. Oh, I thought you were going to say I've been bad and I'm afraid of going to hell. Well, <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> that too. Yeah, and I think that's a big Possibly. part. Possibly, yeah. possibly, uh, yes. And and people who have great faith uh, seem to stream through these things maybe a little easier. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the circumstances, but. I think probably, and most people would agree, the most difficult thing is to um, endure uh, an infant's death or a very young person's death because they haven't even had a chance to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother didn't even get his driver's license and he was killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. You know, so it just doesn't seem fair, does it? That we're, we're having a wonderful time and we've still got probably quite a few more years to go. And they're cut off before they even got to the prime of their life. Mm. So does anybody else want to ask something? You said that nowadays you can get your obituary online for free. Do you mean, does it have to go through a... No. How do you do that? Well, I've got a site for you. And I'll pass out these um, handouts that will give you the sites you can go to. Um, it's on the back. All these tips about writing an obituary. So that's one for you to scribble on. This one's more serious. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, there's, a, there's a bunch of them on there, uh, different sites, and you can look up other people's obituaries. I have a friend who died four years ago or so, and by the time I got around to crafting her obituary, some time had gone by, and I asked her husband if he wanted to go ahead and publish it in the newspaper, and he said, oh, it's going to cost too much money. At this point, just forget it. And so I had this draft of her picture, and I was thinking, maybe just for, you know, history and people searching and stuff, I should never too late one online for her. Of course. And it's not too late. I mean, I mean, I don't think so. I think it's maybe something I'll do. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Anyway, if you'd like to have pass these along, these will give you some hopeful, hopefully, some ideas about what's on the back there. And then the little box about some, uh, the idea of the obituary party. Sure. So, can there be more than one obituary for people? I mean, like, I mean, I submit one for her now, and I didn't know that somebody had already, maybe had done one and published it. Is that going to be... Do you think that's common, really? Because uh, oftentimes people will publish one in different newspapers, oh. knowing that, for instance, we won't see maybe a New York newspaper or in another country. So I, I don't see anything okay. wrong with that okay. at all. Okay. I saw you. Yes. Oh. Good. Yeah, nice. Good. So yeah. I want to leave you with this idea that we talked about earlier. What would your obituary say if you died today? Think about your life, the past, <coughs> how you've been living, when you died. What would you share with your friends and family? Who would you include in your life's obituary? And ask yourself. Which of those would describe your life? Do people remember you with passion, dedication, love, caring, understanding? What would your family say about you, your friends and your teachers? And now I'd like to encourage you to go out there with some of the tools that you have, write your obituary, and have an obituary party. <laughs> I think at the party you could like have a contest who had the most exciting experience you know, that we didn't know about each other or something. You know, you could kind of like make a real, you know, fun party out of it. I mean, you know. But isn't that what a dinner party is like? You know, if you really get conversation going, you find out more about people all the time. And it's amazing how many years can go by that you know people, even your family. And I remember sitting down with my family one time and they mentioned something at the dinner table. And they said, why didn't you tell us that before? 
And I said, well, it never came up. That subject never came up. I don't have any secrets. But, you know, until you ask more questions and start talking, and that's, that's what I think these uh, ideas are about. And, and it would be fun whether you use the obituary or not. It would yeah. be fun to learn about your friends. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to share an experience that I had. I, I um, wrote an obituary for my mother-in-law, who died a little over four years ago. And she had a very interesting life because she was a teenager during World War II in occupied Amsterdam. And um, I, I submitted her the draft obituary to the pilot, and the person that was editing it called me and said, this is really too long. It's going to cost you a lot of money, number one, and number two, if you streamline it, it'll probably make it more interesting. So I did that. Oh, cool. So that was one part of the story, but then um, I got so interested in the parts that I had edited out and other parts that didn't appear that um, I started just writing a more expanded life story about her. And I haven't finished it yet, but the obituary itself was a great jumping off point for um, a larger story oh, about her life. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the more you think about it, the more that comes out, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, people say, oh, my life isn't interesting, or I, you know, I don't have anything to say. But then if you're around them and you prompt them and you start talking, it turns out people are really much more interesting than they think they are. Yeah. Oh, they, they are. are. Yeah. And you meet these kind of people in writing classes. Yes. I met a girl who had been thrown out of India in 1962. There was a, um, a border dispute between Rajasthan and China. And so they said to all the people who had Chinese heritage, you're out or you're on your own type thing. So in 1962, English was her first language in India. Her second language was Urdu and third was um, uh, Punjabi. So they were, at 16 years old, she was sent to China, where then she had to learn Mandarin and Cantonese and finish her university and swim eight laps a day. Well, I mean, right there, there's a fabulous story. Then they, they left China and, and got into Hong Kong, escaped from China, and from Hong Kong, they immigrated to Canada, where she married a German person. So now she's got another language. I mean, just an amazing person. Yeah. Yeah. And still very young, and able to carry on with more and more and more stories. But until you start talking about it, you're right. So we, we've got to talk more about, get people talking about their lives, I think. Yeah. Uh, I've got two things. Number one, back in 2008, um, uh, that you picture was given to the Redwood Funeral Home and it was included in the price of um, cremation. So there wasn't any cost to the individual uh, other than the, the payment of the cremation. And number two, I'm, I must have been, <laughs> had my head buried in the sand but at one time you had to have it in the paper because of laws for um, uh, people to know that you were deceased so that they could come and get part of your goods. Yes, if you owed money or something, yes. So is that true or not? I don't believe it is anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any regulation that says you have to do it. It sounds like you're talking about a notice in a probate matter that's where you publish notice of death mm -hmm. and notice of hearing yep. that an estate's been filed and we're going to have, yeah. So now we're finding ways to avoid probate. You right. See, Not everyone, everyone has to do probate, that's right. Unless you own a couple. I think after, after like, um, one and a half million dollars in assets or something. Yeah, there's a... Yeah, there's yeah. a cutoff, mm -hmm. um, as, at least in Oregon, right? Mm. But, um, no, mm -hmm. you're right. You don't have to. Yes, how can they force you to spend $400 on that? <laughs> <laughs> Newspaper or obituary? Well, I'm really surprised to see so many people here when the State of the Union address was being given. <laughs> <laughs>
same time. So I think that's great. I wish you all well with your obituaries. Does anybody have any other questions? One, one statement yeah. that there's a new writing club forming here in Brookings or Southern Oregon. And when they're meeting in Brookings at uh, Poncho's coming up in a week or two, um, if anybody's interested, they're just, you know, a bunch of local people who like to write, going to get a little club or something together or meet and greet or whatever and then work on projects you do at writing clubs or whatever that is. Oh, that's but nice anyway, to know. Yeah, um, let's see if I can figure out. It's like around mid-month. <clears throat> Sorry. Well, you can see me after. Anyway. Well, you've been a great audience, and I'm pleased, pleased to you. have been here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.